So I want to go on with that discussion and wind my way very quickly to the end of this chapter and then back to linear algebra for a while. So, uh, so a, suppose we're in R3, might as well, though this works more generally, a central force field. And you can keep in mind the example of gravitation. So you have in mind some thing like the sun that is sitting at the origin. And it is exerting a force at each point of space, other than where the object is itself. It is, if you have a test mass m at position x, so this is the vector x here, you would have a force field that depends on where the position x is. And it's called central if it's a continuous vector field. So remember that means it's a mapping, in this case, R3 minus the point where the center is, so I'm going to say the origin, with the property that, first of all, the force at position x is acting in the direction of x, plus or minus. So, so that 1, yeah, so that f of x is some continuous function times x. So all I'm saying to be central is that it acts in the direction of x, plus or minus. Now with gravitation, as you guys probably know, Newton's law of gravitation It is the special case where G is Ah, trapped you. Close, but no cigar. So G minus M1. Refer, so Newton's law says if you have a mass here oh, yeah, yeah. and a mass here, that the gravitational attraction one for the other is going to be some universal constant times the product of the masses, but then, so there's some constant, right? But then it's supposed to be inverse square. So it's, the magnitude is supposed to be inversely proportional to the square of this distance. So you would think, and Matthew fell in the trap, you would divide by magnitude of x squared. But why is Matthew wrong? Because you got the x vector. I've got the x vector, which has length. So I have to divide by the length of that as well. So it's x cubed. So this should be what power? One. Three, two. Sixteen. Sixteen might be right. Cubed, right? So then, in this case, you would have minus g product of the masses over magnitude x squared times the unit vector x over magnitude x. So if you write this is a unit vector, this is inverse square acting back towards the origin. But because I don't have an over magnitude x here, you have to absorb that magnitude into little g, and so you get a q. All right, so We will do a lot more with, with Newton's formula um, 
next semester when we're actually talking about more physics. So we'll talk a lot about inverse square forces and we'll talk about work and Gauss's law and stuff like that. But in the meantime, what I want to prove to you is the following theorem. In the presence of a central force field of any sort, the orbit of a mass Let's say an object. I don't like the orbit of an object is in lies the plane. So you can't have the force field making the object do something like this. You'll, you'll see that that's very easy. And then I want to say Kepler's second law is the rest of this. And the object moves so as to sweep, quote, sweep out area at a constant rate. So I told you yesterday what that means, but we'll actually make it quite precise. So let's do the first part first. But a novel idea. So suppose you start with the particle at some initial position at time zero. And it's moving with some velocity at that moment. Maybe zero. That won't be so interesting. No. Yeah. But it, let's say it's moving with some velocity, which I'm going to draw with its tail at the point, because that's how physicists think. Uh, the vector is really a vector from the origin. But you, as we have been drawing vector fields all together, it's most physically intuitive to draw the vector with its origin, with its tail at the point we're talking about. So this is the initial velocity, let's say, and this is the initial position. Any guess on what plane you think this particle is going to actually orbit in? The plane that those two vectors span. Yeah. Unless, of course, the velocity is in the direction of the position, in which case and line. It, line. It's, gonna, it's actually the orbit's going to end up being a line. <laughs> which still lies in lots of planes. But, yeah. So let's, let's do. So imagine that we put this vector temporarily over here. And then you could think about the plane spanned by the position vector. And that velocity vector at time zero. And you would say that ought to be the plane that the thing stays in. Well, if you're in three space, what's the easiest way to think of a plane? Normal vector. You need a point that the plane passes through. Well, in this case, it's going to be the origin. And you need a normal vector. So what's our candidate for the normal vector to this plane? Cross product of these two vectors. Well, OK, remember that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a vector, which I'll write for fun as, um, I'll write it as A of t, which is the cross product of the position vector and the velocity vector of the particle. Yeah. 
object, whatever it is. If, in fact, the plane spanned by the position and the velocity stays constant, what should be true about A of t? Be in the same direction. It should be in the same direction all the time. So we we want to see first of all that the direction is constant. Maybe the length changes, but the direction it points shouldn't be changing. Well, okay. How do you find out if something's constant? Take the derivative. So let's look at a prime of t. Among our list of <laughs> calculus formulas a few days ago was cross product, product rule for cross product. Yeah, so just do the cross product. Take the product rule, derivative of the first cross the second, plus first, cross derivative of the second. So remember, I'm not, this is functions just of time here. I didn't say g of t here was the, g of t is the orbit, right? So g of t is the position at time t. So t is a scalar. The time is a scalar. I'm just doing functions of one variable. Mm -hmm. You want this to be a t naught in the first? No. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. I did not want <laughs> the naught. Thank you. All right. So, what's this term? Ooh, ooh, ooh. The derivative of squared. Cross. Somebody. There's no area. Right, right, right. So the cross product of vector with itself is zero by lots of ways you can do it. So this term is zero. What about this term? Hmm. Well, I need a little <coughs> physics sidebar here. What's the what's what is the effect? of this force that's yanking on this object, it makes it accelerate, right? That's Newton's yes. second law. <laughs> it's Newton's. <laughs> Me or you? So Newton's second law of motion tells you that the force induces on the mass an acceleration, which therefore we will write as g double prime, right? So Position is g of t, first derivative is velocity, time, derivative of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. So that's the second derivative of position with respect to time. So this is a sloppy sentence because I put, so what, what's the acceleration? It's the force at the point g of t. The force at the point the particles act gives you the mass times the acceleration at that instant. So that's a correct statement. Right? So the force at the point of the particle is mass times acceleration. Well, now you see the punchline, I hope. Do you? What direction is the force? Negative g direction. Oh, I shouldn't have used g here. Ah! Oh, no! That's why. Womp, womp, womp. All right, for that you get a Greek letter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Moving right along, <laughs> the force is a scalar multiple at each point of the position vector. So it's parallel, therefore, to the to g of t. What happens, therefore, when I cross the acceleration vector with the position vector? It's zero. It's zero also. Yeah. Right? They're parallel. The acceleration by this is 1 over mass times this 
whatever it is, times g of t. So these vectors are again parallel. Therefore, the cross product is again 0. Hmm. So a prime of t is 0 for all t. Therefore, this, in fact, is a constant vector. So the normal vector to the plane is not only not changing direction, but it's actually staying constant. So that's going to tell us more. Is there a comment? So, so this is telling us that the vector g of t and the acceleration vector g double prime okay. are parallels. Okay. So the cross product is zero. So in particular, whatever plane is spanned by the initial position vector and the initial velocity vector, that's the plane the particle stays in. And so it just to have a, an astro astronomical uh, side comment, what explains the fact then that the various planets are orbiting in different planes? Well, wouldn't you get hit by a giant rock in space? Yeah, whenever all <laughs> these planets were created by whatever giant explosion there was or whatever mass split apart into pieces, different pieces were flying at different initial velocities. I thought most planets were orbiting in more or less the same plane. It's not far <laughs> off, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. He's got lucky that way. This might be beyond this class, but is there a reason that like... How'd they end up so far apart? Is there a reason that like galaxies and stuff seem more like disks than like just like at atomic like orbs of... Yeah. Well, so yeah, that's... Yeah, I think that's that something that... Like, but moons okay. yeah. don't necessarily all travel in the same direction. No. no. But that's because of like they seem a little flatter. Yeah, so actually I don't know the answer to this. Like, the I shouldn't have opened Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. it's how stuff behaves in that situation when there's a bunch of stuff and it crashes and stuff. There's all sorts of physics involved, however the planets came about, if you had some sort of angular momentum going on, for example, that would tend to align things rotating in a certain, with a certain axis. So it, it's, it's a more complicated question, and I, I actually should have researched it before I opened my mouth. <laughs> Why we need some physics astronomy majors in this class. All we're stuck with is all these economists. Jeez, who cares? It's just money. All right. What about the second half? Well, the fact that that vector is not only constant direction, but constant magnitude must tell us something. It must have something to do with area, huh? What is, what's the magnitude of cross product again? So the magnitude of A of t, which in our case is this constant magnitude of A naught, is the area of the parallelogram spanned by g of t and Prime of t. So if you took the vectors g of t and g prime of t as I was drawing them, they span a little parallelogram. Now that may or may not be the picture you want to think about. So imagine for a second that 
you picture the particle or the object in its orbit. Moving up, so here it is at time t. Where is it a little bit of time later? G of t plus mm -hmm. some, something. So we're looking at a little time later, right? Adding a little h to our time. So if the, if the orbit is looking something like this, then how do we see what g of t plus h looks like? We just, just think of the definition of derivative. Move a little bit along. It's g of t plus g prime times h, right? This scalar, the little bit of time, times the instantaneous velocity tells you approximately the change in the position vector. That's just definition of derivative, right? There's, I'm saying approximately, but the error is small compared to h, right? So I'm imagining, remember we talked about the area swept out. So we want to say, in the little bit of time h, what's the area? Well, I'm in this plane, and I've approximately got this vector and the vector g of t plus h. And I'm looking at how much area is in this sector of the orbit. That's a triangle. So I'm going to say if script A of T denotes the area swept out by the orbit from, from the initial time to the time we're at, so we're way back here, you started off at some initial value of time with an initial position. The, 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 the planet moved in some orbit, and script A of T would be the area of this whole thing from the original to time T. And then A, script A of T plus H would be the area from here to here. So if we want to look at the rate at which area is swept out, we want to look at the derivative of that area with respect to time. Right? So this would be the limit of script A T plus H minus script A of T over H. Where do you see this in the picture. There. Script A of T plus H is all the area up to here, and I'm subtracting the area up to here. So what's, what have I got for the difference? The green area I was talking about, the area that's swept out between time T and time T plus H. <coughs> Well, how do I approximate this green area? Well, for small h, yes, this is a curve that the object is traveling in. But for small h, it's almost as if this were a triangle. And you can actually think about how much error there is. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna be more like a physicist here and not worry about it. So in the limit, I'm claiming it's correct to say that we're looking at the area of this triangle and then dividing by h. Well, what is the area of that triangle? One half the area of the parallelogram we started off talking about, right? Right. So it's going to be one half the magnitude of the cross product of g of t with g prime of t times h. 
oh, this is an H. And I'm going to look at H going just with positive numbers here. So this is a positive H that's moving forward in time, dividing by H. Mm -hmm. Can you go over one more time how A of T plus H minus A of T is the theory of triangle? Well, it isn't exactly. But so you've got this curvy orbit, and I'm saying that if you approximate the curvy orbit by the triangle, the error is ignorable compared to h okay. when h is very small. Okay. Uh, but so I'm saying whatever this curve is, it looks almost identical to a straight line when h is small. Okay. Uh, how, do, how does a of t plus h minus a of t approximate? The area of that. Space oh, because you're looking at area from the beginning to here. Oh, right. We just, Minus we just area decided. from the beginning to here. Okay, we just decided that A is the area. So that's just what we assumed yeah. A is. Okay. Yeah, that's what. Right. <laughs> Where did you get the H in the numerator from? Because the, this little side here, if you're going, yeah, my picture should have had times H here. Okay. Right? If the velocity vector is g prime of t, then the actual displacement, we're saying, is this minus this, which is velocity times a little bit of time. So in this picture, I should have had an h on this side. Take the velocity vector times the amount of little time, and that's this displacement that's happening here. So that was an, that was an error on my part. Thanks. And so, of course, what you see here is the h is canceled, and we get 1 half the magnitude of A of T, which is one half the magnitude of A naught. So this cross product we computed gives twice, the, its length is twice the rate from Sherry's. Any questions? So I mentioned to you guys yesterday the other two of Kepler's laws and invited you to try to do them. you will be on the next week's problem set. But they're challenge problems if you're so inclined to think about them. Um, I do want to talk about a little bit more of physics-y stuff before I move on back to a little bit more math. And that is a question which comes up a lot in physics and a ton in mathematics for example, in differential geometry. What characterizes motion of a particle or an object, say, on a sphere? So if g of t is a curve that lies on a sphere centered at the origin, What must be true? The velocity is constant. So imagine a bumblebee that happens to be flying at a constant distance. Whatever. So magnitude of g here is constant. But it's certainly. It certainly doesn't have to be flying at a constant speed. No. Because it could fly very fast along here and then get tired and slow down. All we're saying is that it's, it's on a tether. It's on a tether. Right. It's a tethered bumblebee, right? <laughs> so all we're saying is that the magnitude of g of t is some fixed constant. Well, in mathematics, Whenever you see some, and let's assume here, of course, g is differentiable. When you see some expression equal to a constant, what's the first thing you should think of in math? Oh, the derivative. The derivative is zero. So 
knee-jerk reaction here should be to say, ah, the derivative is zero. Now, there's another thing that you should think about. How do you compute the magnitude of a vector? So I don't like saying components. Dot it with itself. So what could, but do you like taking derivatives of square roots that much? So what should you instead say to yourselves? The constant square. Right, constant yeah. square. Still constant. So if we call this c, this would be c squared. Not necessarily meaning speed of light here, thank you. The bump b is not that advanced. <laughs> but, right, this is a good lesson that you should have learned back in calculus when someone gave you a problem to minimize the distance from something to something as we did day three of this class, doing Cauchy Schwartz, you should say, I'd rather minimize distance squared. Right? That saves me chain rule, square root, yucky algebra. Same thing here. Rather than taking square root, I'm just going to say, this dot product is constant. All right? Now use your knee-jerk reaction. What should I do with this equation? Differentiate it. Use the product rule, which we also stated for dot products. So by the product rule, what do we get? G dot plus two times. Two, two, because dot product is symmetric. Now, except for Dan, what are you all going to say must be true? They're perpendicular. Well, no, you're skipping steps, and you're ahead of me. I'm being sort of facetious here. If twice this number is zero, then any number is zero. Just that number is Dan knows why I'm picking on him. <laughs> Justin knows too. Because in abstract algebra, you deal with universes where two times something can be zero, but the something might not be zero. However, in the land of calculus, we don't have to worry about such things. The only way twice a real number can be zero is for the real number to be zero. So what's the geometric interpretation? The position vector and the velocity vector must be must be orthogonal. How many of you knew that? Right, so wherever the particle's moving, the velocity and the position must be orthogonal. What's the intuitive argument for that? Forget this math stuff. What's the what's how should you understand that intuitively or physically? You have to stay on the same distance away from the origin, so you instantaneously look to moving in a straight line. But why must the straight line be orthogonal to where you are? Well, okay. Otherwise it'll change the distance from the origin. That's it. So we're back to the anteater discussion and the gradient of distance from the origin again. If your velocity had any component that was parallel to your position vector, instantaneously you would be either increasing or decreasing your distance from the origin. The only way that you maintain the distance the same is to have a right angle there. Do you think the converse is true? If the velocity and the accelerate, oops, if the position and the velocity are orthogonal always, must the particle be moving on a sphere centered at the origin? It could it be that staying still? Yes. That's moving on a sphere centered at the origin. <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah, so Matthew's yeah. saying g prime could be zero for all t. That would hold here. Well, then g is a constant. Its distance from the origin isn't changing. So that fits my setup. Do you think it's true? 
but well, it doesn't <laughs> the same physical argument we just gave yeah. work backwards. Yeah. Yeah. What's the math that you need to turn this backwards? Suppose this is true. Then what? Then twice it is zero, which means the derivative of this quantity is zero. And if you have a function of time on, a, on an interval whose derivative is always zero, then the function is constant. Every step here is reversible. Right? A function, a differentiable function, this is important for you to know, and it certainly gets used a lot of places. A differentiable function is constant on an interval if and only if it's derivative. So this is very close to homework you're doing now. Not quite, but very similar in flavor to homework you're doing. It is everywhere zero on that interval. So the derivative of this is zero, therefore this is constant, so it is on a sphere centered at the origin. Why must the sphere be centered at the origin? If you were centered up, if you were at a sphere over here and, and flying around on it, would it still be true? No, no. because the, 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 your velocity vector has to be on the same sphere. It's Right, it's only perpendicular to the radius vector from the center of the sphere. It's not perpendicular to the radius vector from an arbitrary origin. So you just set the arbitrary origin at the center of the sphere. <laughs> In order for it to be true, you have to. Right. So it has to be a sphere center of the origin. All right, I want to I close the discussion with something we're going to use more next semester than this semester, but still something to talk about with curves, is arc length of a curve which is some topic that you had hand-waved at you back in the beginnings of integral calculus. So, what is the arc length of a curve? So, suppose you take some continuous path. Suppose I'll stick with G. Suppose it's mapping some interval to Rn. And so let's say it's continuous for starters. What is your notion if you have our bumblebee or a mosquito flying along a path? You would like to measure how much distance he flies. What's the length of his path? How might you do that? How might you actually define it? You're not allowed to mention any derivatives or any formulas yet. Circles. <laughs> Think back to what you did in integral calculus over and over and over again. You tried to approximate things. So what would be a good approximation to the length of a curve? A bunch of small little tiny units. Just what do you mean by triangles? You could approximate the length of the curve by making one of its edges. Yeah, making like one of So you don't need to say the word triangles. You just want to take points on the curve and join them by straight lines and approximate by chords. Right? You could approximate the curve by approximate by chords. Right? You could approximate the curve by a bunch of straight line segments. Supposed to be a straight line. Now, how do you think this green bunch of line segments length is compared to the length of the curve if it has one? It's shorter. It's shorter. So you might consider all inscribed polygonal paths and take 
their lengths and do what with that to try to get what you think the length of the curve should be? The limit is the limit the limit is the limit. There may not be a greatest, though. At the time interval? So you, you, could, you could take the interval from A to B, and you could split it up as if you were thinking integrals. So some of you have seen this, some of you have not. Um, let's say M. You could make a partition of the interval AB. You could divide it up into a finite number of pieces. Look at where each of those dots lands on the curve and look at the lengths of those line segments. And you can define the length of G to be taking the set of all polygonal approximating lengths, which we could write out a formula for, but I won't. And that's a set of numerical values, and you guys are saying intuitively you want to take the biggest one, but there won't be a biggest one usually. So take the what? So take the So remember from chapter two I mentioned the word soup, or at least upper bound for a set of real numbers that had an upper bound? That's what you want to do here. Assuming that this set of numerical approximations has an upper bound, you take the least upper bound and that's what the length of the curve should be. If this set of approximating lengths has arbitrarily large numbers in it, what do you think that's going to mean? The curve has infinite length. There are examples of that which I won't bore you with today. So the theorem is, with a reasonable hypothesis, we can actually compute this. And the theorem is, if G is continuously differentiable, then the length of the curve is gotten by integrating, well, approximately what tells me this length? This is what we were just talking about. If, if this happened over a small time change h, what approximates the length here? Magnitude of g prime. times the little bit of time you traveled. The distance you traveled is approximately the magnitude of your velocity times the little bit of time you traveled. Adding those up is what integrals do. Now what is this, what is length of velocity called? Speed. Does this make sense? You're driving in your car, you're watching your speedometer, you're also watching your odometer turnover saying you've now traveled 153 miles. So wait. Did you know your odometer is doing an integral? It is. So this could be a curve that goes back on itself, speed? goes over the same That's point twice. Yeah. Yes. We're talking about the distance traveled. So if you're, if you're going like this, if you're being an in, in, a, 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 um, indecisive shopper going back and forth in the aisles, <laughs> you're still walking back and forth. The total distance you've traveled, so when I say length, I mean the length you traversed. So this should make intuitive sense, right? In a little bit of time, you travel at a certain speed, then the distance you travel is speed times time. So breaking it up into lots of little pieces, that's what the integral does. So tomorrow I may actually tell you a little bit about why that's true. But I just want to do an example for the end of today. Suppose g of t is cosine cubed t sine cubed t. t goes from 0 to 2 pi. Anybody have any idea what that looks like?
Notice, if you put just cosine sine, what would you have? A circle. So this would be cosine t, sine t. What would it look like if I put squared exponents? Cosine squared t, sine squared t. What do you know about cosine squared and sine squared? Always positive. Their sum is one. Their sum is one. How do I graph x plus y equals one? But then by symmetry, it's going to be the exact same thing. Well, actually, if t is going from zero to two pi, cosine squared to sine squared are always going to be in this this quadrant. So you're just going to go back and forth on that line. But you could imagine trying to make it symmetric and then you'd have a square, which might. What do you think the cubed is going to do? It's going to, it's going to bring things in more, because taking a cube of a number less than one makes it even smaller. So what you're going to get is a curve that actually bows in symmetrically like that. And if, you, and if you took higher and higher powers, it bows in more and more and more. If you took smaller exponents, it would bow it out. OK, so that, let's do the problem. What's the length of g? Integral from 0 to 2 pi. Of the derivative. I have to take the length of g prime. Tell me what g prime is. <coughs> Cosine squared t times negative sine t. And then 3 sine squared t. Now, how should we make our life as simple as possible? You guys always want to make algebra as hard as possible. <laughs> what should we do to make finding the length of that vector as simple as possible? Think. Factor out as much as I can factor out. You can really get a two is cosine t sine t. Two? Three. 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 Like, well, you can take, well, yeah, but like, <laughs> you can turn it. Never mind. Oh, I know what you're trying to do. That's, I don't want to do that. Oh, okay. What can we factor out from both terms? Three, Three cosine t sine t. Oh, okay. so And then what am I left with? Uh, like cosine sine. 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 No, 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 no. Cosine sine. Right. Yes. Yeah. No. So negative. is that what I should have factored out? Yes. Yes. Because then you get negative cosine. Negative cosine. You get a so I'm left sine. with a cosine. No, a negative. With a negative. And, and a sine. sine. And a sine. And then the magnitude of that is. What's the magnitude of this vector? One. One. What's the if I have a scalar times the vector, what do I do with the scalar? Just pop it Just out. Absolute value. Absolute. absolute value. Don't forget that. I guarantee you I will trap you at some point this semester or next. So how do we deal with that integral of absolute value? What, how did you standardly do integrals of absolute values? You have to break it into pieces. Break it into pieces. But by symmetry, it's going to be the same absolute value in all four quadrants. So by symmetry, if you haven't thought about that, think about it a little bit. Think about what sine times cosine does in the four quadrants. Sine t. Cosine t, what's the easiest way to do this? You could do what Matthias wanted and use double angle, or you could just U, du. So U is sine t, it goes from 0 to 1. And then you have U, du, and written from 0 to 1. Which is easy. The answer is 
What? Where's the three? You square it every day. Okay. Wait, how did you get the three outside the end? Okay. Isn't it? Am I? Oh, right. Okay. You know, I, I, I should value three is three. I'm thinking. Okay, we're done. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That,